running second only to the Bible, I believe the greatest selling book of all time, the greatest selling Jewish book, is Harold Kushner's Why Do Bad Things Happen to Good People? It's a question that's bothered many of us for so many years. I remember reading, in fact, a July edition of Life magazine back in the 1990s, where they posed the question to young children, what question would you like to ask of God? And the most recurring question from all these young adolescents, from these fledgling young children was, God, why does my friend Tiffany have to have cancer? Why does this person have to suffer? It's a question that's bothered us all. Let's go back to Hamlet, Act 4, Scene 5. When sorrows come, they come not single spies, but in battalions. We're all plagued incessantly by such a question. And of course, there have been many answers that we've heard, that we've read throughout our lives. One answer that appears throughout Jewish writings, made famous especially by Nachmanides, the medieval commentator, is that we have a Jewish belief in the afterlife. The picture that we see, that we view down here, it doesn't end with Olam Hasa, with this world. There's a world that exists beyond this world, and that's an eternal and infinite world. That's a world that God says, when the truly righteous, that's where they will reap the benefits, the pleasures of all their positive actions, all their boons, all their good deeds, and that's as well the same realm within which the nefarious, the wicked, amongst us will get their just desert. The picture can't end with Olam Hazar, with just this world. Our sages tell us, in fact, in Ethics of the Fathers, that this world is merely the precursor, is merely just a harbinger leading us into the next world. This is the world of action, the world where we have to study, where we have to grow, where we have to perform good deeds, acts of loving kindness. And even if we don't see ourselves reaping the benefits from all those good deeds and all those positive actions, it's because the picture doesn't end here. There's an afterlife, and that afterlife consists of a world of bliss, a world of basking in warm proximity by God's divine presence, a world where the Amoraic sage Rav tells us in Tractate Brachot in the Babylonian Talmud in 17a that in Olam Haba, in the next world which is appropriately labeled Olam Haba, it's the world that comes after Olam Haza, it comes after this world. And in such a world, the sages of the Talmud tell us there won't be any eating, no drinking, no marital relations, no need for any physical mundane desires, no physical pursuits, no pejorative character traits, no jealousy, no hatred, no competition. It's a world of eternal, infinite bliss, basking in the warm light and the warm embrace of God's divine presence. So you'll ask, if we're not really living for this world, if all the pleasures, all the real reward and punishment is not going to come in this world, Certain dosages, small dosages, might indeed come in this world, but the bulk of it is really destined for the world to come, so then why don't we have so many mentions of this world to come in the pages of the Scriptures? Yes, we have a garden of paradise. You open up the book of Genesis right as it commences, chapters 2 and 3. We have Gan Eden. We have the garden of paradise. And the Greek Septuagint, in fact, they translated it as paradise, which many scholars believe comes from the Persian word for park or garden. Okay. It's discussed as well in Ezekiel in chapter 28, a garden of paradise. But we know throughout the writings of the Mishnah, of the Talmud, throughout all the ages, we have bandied all over the place. We have an idea of Olam Haba, of Gehenim, of Purgatory, of Heaven. So why isn't it all throughout the Scriptures itself? It's a question that has bothered many. One of the famous answers is that when all is said and done, it's still something that we can't relate to, we can't understand, we can't taste the true beauty and splendor of what such spiritual, purely spiritual worlds are all about. So thus, Rabbi Elio Dessler, in his work, Mirtam Leo, in the first volume, on page 5, he says, that if you look throughout the scriptures, God says, if you listen to my mitzvot, if you perform my commandments, and you're a good, devout, pious Jew, you know what your reward is? I'm going to give you rain. I'll give you materialistic desires. I'll give you all that you need to function properly in this world. And clearly, such statements beck an inquiry that's what it's all about. It's all about rain. It's all about financial license to purchase the materialistic goods, desires. That's what it's all about. God tells us, you learn my Torah, you do my mitzvot, and the way in which I reward you is by giving you materialistic means. Well, what's that all about? It explains Rav Dessler based on Maimonides and his laws to repentance. The idea is that God says, I'm going to give you all the means that you need at your disposal to achieve all the spiritual pursuits 
that I'm delineating in my Torah, in my scriptures, that what I'm telling you to do, I'm going to provide for you. If you listen, you obey the commands that I give, and you perform my mitzvot, then I will give you everything that you need at your disposal to maximize your spiritual pursuits. Because this is the world where it has to be done. This is the world where we need to have materialistic needs in order to fully pursue all the spiritual dreams and aspirations that we have that God asks us to spend the bulk of our lives involved with. If we work on that spiritual pursuit down here in Olam Haz in this world, then we will indeed merit in the world of the afterlife where the truly righteous will reap all their benefits and the truly wicked, that's where they'll meet the suffering. But God says it's not about this world, it's about next world. I will give you everything you need in this world in order to get to the next world. To put it on the pages of the Torah, it's not something you can relate to. It's not something that you have any real semblance. You could taste a little bit on the Holy Sabbath, for example. But I'll give you something you can relate to. The true reward, though, for all the learning of Torah, all the studying of Torah, for all the mitzvot, all the commands that you do, our tractate Kedushin, and the Babylonian Talmud tells us in 39b, there is no reward. All those mitzvot, all those commandments, all the moral and ethical manifestations of a life well lived, the real benefits won't be in this world. They'll be in the next world. We don't have it in this world. And as an example, he gives an unbelievable illustration, Rabbi Dessler. He says that if you would imagine all the possible feelings of satisfaction, of exhilaration here in this world, and you would lump them all together, they wouldn't even reach one iota of what purely spiritual pleasure is in the afterworld. Because down here, we're still a pristine, pure soul, but locked within the confines of a physical, materialistic body. In the afterlife, when our pristine soul gets to leave, gets to depart from the physical body, then and only then can you truly appreciate unbridled, unfettered, glorious splendor of basking in the warmth of God's divine presence. That's the afterlife. That's what we're aspiring towards. This world is merely the alleyway leading us into the grand banquet hall where God says, this is where I want to give you all the reward and benefits and all the pleasure. Not like many of the great religions in the world espouse that it's going to be physical desires, physical manifestations and expressions of our materialistic dreams. No, it's all spiritual. So we might not be able to fully grasp it down here. But if we read throughout the Mishnah, throughout the Gemara, throughout our Talmud, and we see the rabbis the sages expound in this idea over and over again, we get a greater appreciation of a pure spiritual bliss is all about. That's the afterlife. And yes, indeed, as a Jew, we do believe in it. We must believe in it. And we know that it provides a lot of answers, a lot of missing pieces to the puzzle, especially that age-old question of why the righteous have to suffer. They do, but only in this world. In the next world, in the afterlife, they'll get all the rewards that they've worked so diligently and so hard for for so many years.